Greetings to you as we gather for worship today. We are Lawton Centenary United Methodist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma, and we are so delighted that you have joined us. In fact, I want to say a special thanks to all of you who watch us online. Last Sunday, over 1,500 families watched our services, including our communion service, and we are so grateful to you for that kind of participation. Uh, please continue to watch. As you pull those things up, you can like them and you can share them with others. And that's a wonderful way to share Christian witness uh, throughout the world at this time. I'd also like to remind you that on the 21st, we are reopening the church for worship. So the 830 traditional service, the 1050 traditional service, and the 1050 contemporary service, the refuge, will all be open that day. And I hope that you'll make a special effort to get here. It is Father's Day, and it will be a wonderful day in our ministry together. We will only be open for worship, not for Sunday school or small groups. Uh, we're going to start with worship, and we'll just take things sort of step by step as we work back into the process of being fully reopened. And if you need to stay home for health reasons, we will be live streaming the worship services. So you'll be able to... Uh, go on Facebook and uh, go on our, the church's webpage, and you'll be able to watch traditional or contemporary worship live as it happens. Thanks to all of you who donated to purchase uh, equipment that made that possible. We're so grateful to you. Also on the 21st, that will be our last Sunday with Pastor Matt, and uh, I know that you're going to want to uh, see him and, uh, and wish him well on his next assignment. And then on the 28th, we receive as a new associate, John Hiller. And he's excited to come and to be here. And we look forward to the blessings he will bring to this congregation. On this wonderful Sunday, let us unite our hearts in worship. God loves us as we are because God's love is forever. God loves us for who we are because God's acceptance is forever. God loves us for who we can become, because God's love gives us hope in all things. Good morning. We'll be singing today, All Creatures of Our God and King. Oh, 
Good morning, church. Now let's join our hearts together in prayer. God of compassion, we confess that in our busyness, we do not always love. We get caught up in what we know and what we want, putting our desires ahead of everyone and everything else. Forgive us, God, for words that hurt, actions that destroy, knowledge that belittles, and addictions that consume. Forgive us when our pride and self-righteousness builds walls in our relationship with you, with our family, our friends, and our neighbors. Help us to be kind and loving and to be encouraging to others instead of demeaning them. Make us agents of your transforming hope in a hurting world. Give us the courage to embrace one another, to forgive and to love even as you love. In the name of the one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we know the heart of God, we pray this prayer to you that we were taught when Jesus came and said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. 
please turn with me to Genesis 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Merim, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of a woman. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. By the time I was eight years old, my mother had already buried her parents, her husband, and a son. And yet my house was a, was a home filled with laughter. In fact, if you ask me what I remember about growing up, probably one of the first things I would say to you is my mother's laugh. My mother had learned to, to find humor and joy in every situation. And she had learned to even laugh in the face of tragedy, which is one of the most powerful medicines in the world. Look at the Bible. The Bible's filled with humor. In our sort of stiff Protestant way of looking at things, uh, passed on to us by Puritans and Victorians, we often miss the humor in the Bible. Adam and Eve discover they're naked, that they're vulnerable. And so they make underwear out of poison ivy to cover themselves. Loose, oaky translation, of course. Elijah, when he's up on top of, of Mount Carmel, there's, a, there's that drought and the, the, the cool air is blowing in from the sea and they, they, they know that the land can be turned around if there's a miracle. And Elijah is there to do battle with the prophets of Baal and, and, and their God never shows up. Baal never shows up. And so Elijah starts telling bathroom jokes, accumulating with him, making fun of Baal, saying, well, maybe he's just still in the bathroom. Maybe it's taken a long time for him to, you know, get things done there. And then, of course, there's the wonderful story of Balaam, who, who won't do what God wants him to do and won't listen to anybody else. So God gives Balaam's donkey the power to speak and appoints the little donkey to explain things to Balaam, which is an Old Testament way of, of saying, here's one you-know-what talking to another you-know-what, which would have been hysterically funny to the people of that era when those words were, were first put together. Even Jesus is funny. 
There's a great scene in the New Testament, right? Where, where the tax collectors come to collect taxes, the temple tax from Jesus and his followers. And Jesus is perturbed because no one should have to pay a tax to go to worship. But, but he, he decides to, to sort of make a little point. And he tells F Peter, who's a fisherman, to go down and do some fishing while the tax man waits. So Peter goes down, throws in his line, immediately he catches a fish, fish, he reels it in, and its mouth is full of money, the exact amount needed to pay the taxes, which Peter then takes those coins from the fish and delivers them to the tax man. Oh, the payment is made, but it smells like fish guts on a hot, hot day. Don't try sending in your taxes that way. The Bible it, it, it recognizes that in life we need to laugh, we need to be joyful, and especially when hard times come, we can rely on that joyfulness and that laughter and that, that deep, intense experience of being able to look tragedy in the eye and come out on top. And when you read the stories in the Bible, you soon discover that that God has great affection for those characters in faith, those in the Bible, those who have come since, and those who live, some of who are in our own church. God has great affection for those people who in the face of hardship and tragedy can shake their hands at the sky and cry out, we're going to beat this thing. In the world in which we live right now, facing challenges in our nation and facing, facing a global pandemic. We need to raise up more people of faith who can stake out a territory and say, we're going to have joy in this place. That's not Pollyannish. It's not, it's not denying the serious issues we face. It's saying that we can meet these things and we can overcome them with love and with joy. Some of you have heard me say, some of you parents, and I believe it with all of my heart, the most important thing you can teach your children outside of faith in Jesus Christ is to be happy. That's not something that, that people tend to just sort of have innately in them. It, it has to be taught and passed on. In fact, right before today's scripture that, that we, we just read from Genesis 18, right before that, God is visiting with Abraham. Abraham's 100 years old, Sarah's 90 years old, and God tells Abraham he's going to have a son from which God will, will build this mighty lineage. And it says that Abraham laughed so hard that he fell down on his face. I suppose at 100 years old, just about anything, including a deep breath, might knock you over. But that's still quite a laugh. Which brings us to today's story. It's a wonderful and an amazing story. It's about Abraham, who, who comes from a poor and challenged background, but who will become a servant of God and serve God in a powerful way. And it's about his wife, Sarah, whose name literally means princess. And that's how she looks at herself and how she expects to be treated, or at least she did most of her life. But now she is old and she is weary and she feels broken. In fact, she has, she's become so crushed by the burdens of life and by the fact she can't have a family, that she's willing to resort to anything. Now, this is a, a woman who, who once, once commanded the room when she walked in. The kind of person that, that when she entered a room, every eye turned and focused on her. In fact, the, the ancient rabbis tell a, a, a little mythological story about how when God was, was determining what would be beautiful, he, he took all the beauty and, and he put it out and he gave about 48% of the beauty to Eve and about 48% of the beauty to Sarah. And with what was left over, he poured it out on the rest of us and the other living things in the world. 
She was so beauty, beautiful that a king fell in love with her and wanted her as his own. She was so beautiful that a, that a pharaoh fell in love with her and wanted her as his own. But that's all past now. She finally resorted to saying to Abraham, go have a child with one of the slaves. That way at least you'll have an heir because I have nothing left to give you. That's the setting when today's story begins. Abraham is sitting out on his front porch, the front porch of his tent, which is what um, older guys do sometimes. And he notices three people coming up the path. Now, if you go to Israel today, you see a beautiful nation filled with lovely flowers. You give an Israeli a three-foot by three-foot space, and they will fill it with flowers. That's just their national character. But back in the time of Abraham, there were, there were vast areas that were, that were really wastelands. They were hot. The sun beat down, and that's where Abraham is. In fact, Abraham really is at the edge of a cemetery is where he lives now. Because he's, he's old and he feels the end is coming. Sarah feels like the end is coming. So they've, they've bought a cave in the side of the mountain so they'll have a place to be buried when they die. And they're just sitting there outside of that cave waiting to die, thinking their life has no more purpose. And Maybe you've experienced that feeling. That feeling of just waiting outside of the tomb for this to all be over. If you've had that experience, or if you're, if you're feeling something like that right now, pay very careful attention to what this story says and tells us about God and about our purpose. So these three characters come up the road. Abraham doesn't know that it's God and two angels. He just sees three strangers. And in the great tradition of the Middle East that continues even to this day, he feels obligated to offer them hospitality. You'll remember the writer of Hebrews looks back at this moment and says to the early Christians, be sure to entertain strangers, for there were those who did and entertained angels unaware. We're always called to be hospitable, especially to the stranger in our midst especially to the vagabond and the vulnerable. And so Abraham greets his three guests, not knowing who they are. And, and, and is, is his character in this particular time in his life, he's very humble. He said, would you please stay with me for just a while and we'll fetch some water and you can wash your feet. Back then, that was the major means of transportation, so that's an act of, of real kindness. We'll get a little water for you to drink and, and a few morsels of bread. And the three guests agree. And while they rest under the shade of the tree, and those of you who, who, who know what it's like on an Oklahoma day when it's 104 or more and you're outside maybe doing yard work or you're at the lake and you're doing activities, you know what it's like to finally get that moment of rest when you can sit in the shade and cool down. And Abraham has given them that moment as a true act of kindness and hospitality. And as they rest there, he goes in and he says to Sarah, quickly. He doesn't say just make something for them to eat. He says, go and get the best. I want you to really think about that for a moment. To these strangers who've come up the path, to whom he has no obligation and no relationship, Abraham's decision is not to give them leftovers, not to give them what he doesn't need. He gives them the best. So Sarah does as he asks. She begins to prepare, prepare bread from the finest flour. And, and while she does that, Abraham goes out and he finds a choice calf. The scripture, uh, particularly in the Hebrew, describes it as just scrumptious. That, that feeling you get when you're starving to death and you walk by somebody who's got something awesome on the grill, Abraham prepares the calf. 
And then he begins to serve his guest. And this was the custom in the ancient times. Uh, his wife Sarah, the princess, makes herself scarce, except... Like a lot of people, she's very curious. In fact, she, she's dying to know what's going on. Now, to spy on somebody in your home today is a little harder because, you know, we have solid doors and, and the TV is usually turned up loud. And, and people often, even when they're sitting in a room together, communicating by text. But it wasn't that way at Sarah's place. All she had to do was stand outside the tent flap. And that's what she does in order to hear what the men are talking about. And now God is revealed. And he says to Abraham, when the time is right, I will return, and you and Sarah will have a child. Now, this, these are astonishing words. To someone who, who, who the man is 100 and the woman is 90. But it is God's way. Even though they are camped just outside their own graves, God has not forgotten. Even though they have they've placed their tent next to, the, next to the spot where their bones will reside, God still has work for them to do. It's so often true in faith that when we feel at our, our most worthless, when we think we can't do it, we can't go on, there's just no hope, when we find ourselves sitting at the edge of our own grave, God comes to reclaim us. God comes to restore us. And God comes to do miraculous work in our life, not just to bless us, but so that we might be a blessing to others. When a nation is down on its knees in agony, God longs to restore that nation. Not because he loves one nation over another, but because God wants people to have hope and opportunity. And he calls upon us to give it to them. When the world is, is down on its knees with a pandemic and the terror of unseen death, God longs for the world to be restored. Now, God could have just created a lineage, but God chose to work through these two people who were broken, living on the edge of death itself. Are you addicted? Don't give up. Is your marriage in tatters? Don't give up. Have you just had to let go of a dream? Don't give up. Are your relationships broken? Don't give up. Lift up your head. God is walking up the path to you to claim you, restore you, and rebuild your life so that you can be a blessing to others. Well, God says this, and, and the scripture explains something that's very interesting. Uh, in, the, in the very incredibly polite English translation, it, it says something along the way that, along about that, that Sarah was not like other women now, which, which some people will interpret as, as her saying that, that she's no longer having a period, she can no longer have children, and that's, that's accurate. But I find her own words the way she spoke them in Hebrew, the way she thought about it, the way others would have thought about her, to be the most powerful. Because in the Hebrew text, it says that Sarah was no longer on the path of women. Sarah was no longer on the path of women. 
But there is this sense of identity for women. It's more than, than being a mother. It's more than raising children, although that is a part of it for some women. It is a way of looking at the world and interacting with the world that is very powerful. But Sarah, whose very name meant princess, no longer had that as a part of who she was. Her identity had simply ceased to exist. She hears God's words on the other side of the tent. And she musters something up in her spirit that is amazing and powerful. She recognizes the absurdity of it all. And if you measure life much at all, if you're sitting there in the waiting room ready to have cancer treatment, or if you're, if you're ready to get in the car to go to the cemetery to bury a close friend you grew up with, you recognize that life is absurd. It doesn't always make sense. It doesn't always seem right. It doesn't always seem like it's working out the way that it really should. And it's that moment you have to laugh. You have to laugh deep down in your heart and your soul and then rise up and shake your fist and say, but I'm going to beat this thing. With God on my side, I can do it is exactly what God tells this couple. God says to them, there's nothing too wonderful for God to do. The, the, the language actually comes from the creation story. It's a word that describes beauty and wonder and awesomeness. And God says to them, there's nothing that I can do for you except Make your life awesome. Make your life wonderful. And make your life beautiful so that you might share wonder and awesomeness and beauty with the people around you. That's why we were created. If you're saying to yourself, why am I here? If you're struggling right now with some terrific burden and, and you feel like you've lost your identity the way that Sarah did, there's your answer. We're here in the midst of the absurdity to be outrageously extravagant in our faith. To be outrageously extravagant in our love. To be outrageously extravagant filled with wonder and awe and beauty in how we relate to the world and transform it to be outrageously extravagant in our faith in God because we have a God who is outrageously extravagant in his love for us, who can look at us when we're on the edge of the tomb itself and say, I will make you alive again who calls us back from the grave even as he raised up his son Christ and who can resurrect us in our brokenness and fill our hearts with laughter once again. Now Sarah has this, this deep and powerful, incredible, reflective moment. It gets translated again very politely in the English Bible. Sarah says, shall I have pleasure again? And most people read that in a way that has a sexual connotation. But, but there's more going on here. It's a lot deeper than that. What Sarah literally says in Hebrew is, shall I have Eden again? That's right. She says the very word for the garden of creation itself. This is Sarah who had, who had fallen off of the path of women, who had lost her identity, lost her sense of power. Once she had looked kings and pharaohs in the eye 
and overwhelm them with her beauty and her intelligence and her brilliance, who now sits by the side of the grave waiting to die, who has been touched by God to transform the world, including you and me who owe our faith to Sarah. And she asked the question, is it possible? Is it, is it really possible to have Eden in my heart again? To be centered in God's mighty acts of creation and life? To be filled with life in a way that, that I am productive and creative and transforming? When Sarah says, can I have Eden again? What she's asking God is, is, does my life still have purpose? Do I still have a reason to live? And if you're asking that question this morning, lock on to this story in Genesis 18 because it is God's word to you today. And God responds in that way that someone who loves us responds. He says, Sarah, did you laugh? And Sarah says, no, I didn't laugh, right? She suddenly realized who she's talking to. Now she gets it. And God says, yes, you did. You laughed. And this amazing way of connecting, teasing her, God teases her like she's a member of, her, of his own family because she is, like she's a, a, a delightful grandchild who has been struggling for a day. And God has claimed this child. And now he's teasing with her, playing with her, and laughing with her. Maybe you've never done this, but I bet most of you have. You've had a moment with a, with a child or a grandchild where things were just so tough she just wanted them to be happy. And so you, you were just willing to do anything you could to put a smile on their face. We were at a family thing a few years ago, and I could tell my granddaughter, Kelsey, she was pretty little then. She was, she was just miserable. I said, Kelsey, what's wrong? She said, Papa, I just want you to put me in a box, put a towel on my head, and mail me to Africa. How she came up with that, I don't know. But it was an obvious communication to her papa that she needed out of that place at that time. I said, Kelsey, let's go get in my car. We're leaving all these people behind, your mom, your dad, your sister, your grandma, everybody, and it's just me and you time. And in just 15 minutes, she was laughing and giggling again. That's what God wanted for Sarah. That's what God wants for you today. God wants to gather you up, pour out love into your life, focus you again on your purpose, invite you to be blessed so that you might be a blessing to other people. And here's the only thing that will stop that from happening in your life, is if you say no to it. So often in life, we, we deal with the bad stuff so much that it almost becomes a part of who we are. Abraham and Sarah had pitched their tent next to their grave. And they were ready to die. Thinking about death had become their way of life. And now God has poured out his love on them. And everything is about to change. The New Testament writers will, will, will share with those first Christians, look at the faith of Sarah. They'll talk about how she believed, how she came to trust in God when, when faith and trust should have been impossible. She believed. Peter himself will say, if you want to be a, purpose of, a person of faith following Jesus, this is your example, Sarah. We have to be willing to accept the gift. To shake our fist at the heavens themselves and say, I'm going to beat this. 
With the help of God, I know I can do it. In a church, there was a couple. They weren't a couple yet. It was a, a man and a woman. They were both single, and, and they were attending the church, and they were beloved. And the church was very delighted when they started to notice them that they were starting to sit together. And if there was a church dinner, they went to the church dinner together. And, and if, there, if the choir was doing a concerto, they would be sitting there together listening to the concerto. And, and the church was even more delighted when they announced that they were going to be married. And the church celebrated their wedding together. As they were something of an older couple, it was difficult for them to conceive and have a family. So they got a doctor's help. And once again, the church was delighted when they announced that they were pregnant with twins and expecting those twins to be born in a few months. And then one night, the pastor got a call. There had been a miscarriage, and both of the twins had died. It was a heartbreaking moment for the couple. They had dreamed such big dreams. They had such high hopes. And now they were gone. The pastor found himself meeting with them and thinking, we should be sitting in this room planning two baptisms. Instead, we're planning a, a little ceremony so that they can say goodbye. After the ritual was laid out and they chose the Bible verse they wanted, they asked the pastor, they said, we have one request. At the end of the service, we'd like you to play or somebody to play that wonderful recording by Louis Armstrong, What a Wonderful World. The pastor thought it was a strange request, but he couldn't say no to this couple after what they had suffered. The day came for a little brief remembrance service. Most of the church was there to share their grief. The pastor spoke words of compassion and kindness and then said a prayer. And the music began to play. Old Satchmo, Louis Armstrong, singing, What a wonderful world this could be. And to the amazement of the congregation, the man stood up and his wife stood up. He put his arms around her. And in the midst of that tragedy, they started to dance together. Swaying to Louis Armstrong's wonderful voice. And in a little while, they looked at each other and they laughed. And then the people in the church laughed. And then God laughed. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, church, as we come into this time of giving, let us uh, be in an attitude of prayer together. God of the universe, we come to worship this morning, longing to set our minds on the Holy Spirit, to live with Christ within us. We have not always made room for Christ in the clutter of our lives. We have indulged our wants so often that too often the voice of the Spirit is drowned out. As we dedicate these gifts this morning, may it help us to live more in tune with the Spirit and to use our resources in a way that reflects that Christ is Lord of all our lives. In his holy name we pray. Amen.
Let your lives witness to Christ's love. Let your words bring reconciliation. Let your thoughts be of peace. Let your touch bring healing. Let your actions count for justice. Be a sign of hope and a beacon of joy. Go, and may God's blessing go with you. Amen.